I was four years old, I discovered a door in the world. It appeared at family gatherings as I was talking at length to my aunts and uncles about Jupiter and her many moons, or rather it appeared after, in the aftermath when my parents would pull me aside and make jokes. Always the same joke, by the way, something about eyes glazing over, which shows a profound lack of effort on their part, but I digress. <laughs> A um, few years later, I tried to open the door uh, because it appeared to me again during visits from family friends and my parents' co-workers. The door seemed to want to open. The knob would turn a little when the faces of adults in my life would react positively. But I would soon learn that it was locked when phrases like seeking attention were thrown around for reasons I didn't understand. <coughs> And so my first two lessons were imparted to me. Number one, people don't like talking as much as I like listening. Or the other way around, sorry. People don't like listening as much as I like talking. Middle school came and the door kept approaching in the corners of rooms, getting closer day by day. And I would see it reflected behind me in the chrome painting on the legs of school chairs. Um, which, of course, I could only see by bending in half and putting my head between my knees in the middle of class. And so my third lesson was imparted to me, that nobody talks like I do. Nobody walks like I do. Nobody sits or stands like I do. Nobody behaves like I do. And everyone in the world can see it, except for me. But growing up, I didn't tell anybody about these lessons, about pieces of what I thought was the larger truth of adulthood. How could I? I heard the jokes when people thought I couldn't. I could feel the eyes of my peers when I would rock or blurt or say something that they, but not I, understood was the wrong thing to say. Tourette's doesn't make a kid feel overwhelmed when they, talk, when they think about body language. Attention deficit disorder doesn't make a kid want to scream when their peers tease them with no more intention or malice than with which they tease each other. An obsessive compulsive disorder cer certainly doesn't make it feel as if there is a barrier between me and even my closest friends, a pane of glass, imperfect only slightly enough that I can see it and no one else. And so for 19 years, I assumed I must be immature. If I cried because a kid at lunch took my shoe for all of five minutes. I was clearly the one overreacting. Never mind that bullying is bullying, regardless of duration or intention, or the fact that my well of emotions, clearly so much deeper and more intense than anyone else I knew, was indicative of something not immaturity. My fourth lesson was that I could construct a kind of false maturity, a mask of a sort. Not to hide me, not to transform me into someone else, a mask of frosted glass to smooth out the edges and blur out the parts that get me in trouble. I learned this one early on as well, although it took me a while to finish making the mask itself. By high school, I no longer rocked or mumbled. I only screamed in joy or when no one was around to hear me be upset. I could avoid studying the faces of passers-by, at least in ways that they could notice. And as my desire to break this barrier, to shatter the glass, turned into desperation and eventually depression, I kept it under wraps. My fifth and final lesson was that no matter what anyone tells you, labels are the key to opening the door, to surviving in this world. Because I could relate to you these stories all day. I could tell them to parents, to employers, to anyone. But so long as they remain nameless, so long as I can't give you a word, an all-powerful label, nothing will come of it. I'll be dismissed out of hand. Because when I would have breakdowns as a child, because sometimes the noise of a loud hallway was enough to send me over the edge, even the most compassionate people in my life would routinely tell me to walk it off or to quit pretending. 
because normal conversation for me takes more mental effort than chess does for anyone else. And asking me to behave in any way resembling appropriate for public while also asking me to count change for a hundred dollar bill is like asking anyone in this room to drive two cars at the same time with one hand tied behind their back. So yeah, I'm gonna snap at a couple customers or I'm gonna make more arithmetic mistakes than my coworkers. Thank God that I have a word. I'm autistic. And suddenly the game changes. Suddenly I have help, support. There is infrastructure that hypothetically at least will help me keep me on my feet, keep myself on my feet. But that's the problem, isn't it? That unless I can prove that I'm sufficiently sick, unless I can give you a synonym of deficient, I'm no longer worthy of help. I'm no longer able to get the aid that I need, even though I still have the same limits, the same borders to my behavior. Is it not ludicrous that people cannot be trusted to give an honest account of their limits? Is it not asinine that people who by definition know their own experiences better than anyone else in the world cannot be trusted to communicate those experiences? This problem, this problem, it lies at the center of how we talk about health problems, mental and physical, and how we talk about neurodivergence, things like autism and personality disorders. Because so long as people cannot be trusted at their word, to be honest about their limits, so long as people need to prove that they are sick, to be assumed healthy until diagnosed otherwise, that is a folly and it continues to perpetuate the systematic harm and marginalization and death of human beings. If someone came to you showing no signs of autism or personality disorder or any other neurodivergence, and they told you that eye contact <coughs> will send them into a panic attack 10 times out of 10, what right does that give you to keep telling them to make eye contact with you? What right does that give you to deny them that? Because, yeah, okay, they might be lying, but they risked it. They risked lying, being caught lying, and if you're their employer or in a position of authority, they risked being punished for doing so just so they could avoid eye contact. So yeah, they could be lying about their reasons, but clearly it is an important enough issue to them that they have taken that risk. So what right do you have to deny them their request? I said before that labels are the key to surviving, to opening the door, and I stand by that. But they're a skeleton key, a key to a creaky door that sticks to its frame and has an open hole where the window should be. A key that only works because the lock itself is too heavy to hold itself together. A key that has just enough jagged edges that I'm wearing band-aids on my fingers. A key that works only so long as we keep making excuses to not fix the door.